thank you for being here today. This is, uh, we're very excited to uh, celebrate our 23rd annual celebration of undergraduate research at Dartmouth, the annual Karen E. Wetterhahn Science Symposium. Uh, the symposium, as many of you know, is named in memory of the late Karen Wetterhahn, who was a distinguished professor of chemistry, um, and who guided many undergraduates during her time here and co-founded the Women in Science Project in 1990 when she was Associate Dean of the Sciences. Um, my name is Kathy Weaver. I've been with the Women in Science Project since 1996, and we're now part of the Office of Undergraduate Advising and Research. Um, this, Karen's love of science and desire to see more undergraduates have early research experiences led to this idea of a symposium. Um, it began with like 44 people, and when I last checked, we have 155 posters, and I believe we have 187 students presenting today. Some of them are on electronic screens, and some of them are on print. So after this symposium, I hope you will please join me and many of your colleagues upstairs and on the first floor to see the incredible work that's being done. We're gathered here today to celebrate the accomplishments of our undergraduate researchers and to acknowledge the important contributions of the many faculty members, research associates, and the technicians, grad students, and postdocs who guide, coach, and mentor these young emergent scientists along the way. This is also a time to recognize our broader science community here at Dartmouth and beyond, from the College of Arts and Sciences, the Thayer School of Engineering, the Geisel School of Medicine, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, the Norris Cotton Cancer Center, and our partners up the road at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, Krell. They volunteer their time, their expertise, and facilities and support of undergraduate research, and this work simply could not be done without you. Please join me in applauding everyone's contribution. So each year at WISP, we like to pr proudly recognize faculty members who have been involved as longtime advocates and program supporters. This year we have six awardees. I don't know if that's right, one, two, three. We have five awardees to add to this group, and it now totals 73 faculty members who have sponsored a WISP intern for at least five years. So what I want to do is uh, we're going to have a few introductory remarks before we call up our distinguished keynote speaker, Yorker Karsa, and we'll have more from that in a minute. So as I call up these people, please hold your applause till they're all up together, and we'll do one group photograph. So for 10 years, we'd like to honor Hans Mueller, Research Associate Professor of Physics. I think you're here, Hans. Yes, he is. Rebecca Irwin, who uh, Associate Professor of Bi Biological Sciences, and Jonathan, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce your last, Andio. There you go, Andio Kochia. We'll accept on her behalf. Um, 15 years, Ian Baker, Sherman Fairchild Professor of Engineering. He's not able to be with us, but he will be at the poster session. And Susan Taylor, Adjunct Professor of Chemistry and Earth Sciences, Research Engineer at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab. She's also not able to be here with us, but Lauren Sachs, is she here? Fantastic. I'm going to give them all out at the same time. And then, last but not least, I know I saw you here somewhere, Rob McClung, 20 years, 20 year certificate. 33 interns, yay, Rob. Okay, now you can start applauding. And I'll... Okay, I think next up we have 
The Sigma Psi Christopher Reed competition winners are going to be announced by Professor Dean Wilcox, Professor of Chemistry and Chair of the Dartmouth Chapter of Sigma Xi, the Scientific Honor Society, and he will announce the winners. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Sigma Xi is happy every year to partner with WISP to uh, help celebrate science here at Dartmouth. Um, WISP starts out with students in their first year predominantly, and the Sigma Xi uh, Chris Reed competition uh, recognizes their accomplishments as they're about to graduate. So what is Sigma Xi? Sigma Xi is a science honor society, the Scientific Research Society. It was founded in 1886 by Cornell University engineers, uh, engineering students and faculty uh, as an organization to recognize and promote excellence in science. It has grown since that time to uh, over 700 chapters, uh, 70, 80,000 members worldwide. Uh, it has also expanded to include not only engineering, but uh, lots of different allied uh, basic and applied sciences, as well as science education, science policy, uh, ethics in science. Um, the organization uh, publishes an award-winning magazine, American Scientist, wonderfully accessible articles about science. Uh, it, it advises the government and hosts various uh, forums. Um, and it also provides grants and aid of research to young investigators. And this is something that you all should be on the lookout for. You know, three, four, five hundred dollars in a grant and aid of research uh, fund uh, grant from Sigma Xi can oftentimes make the difference in whether you can do your science or not. Um, the Dartmouth chapter of Sigma Xi basically has two activities every year. We recognize and honor young scientists, older established scientists with membership. Uh, membership is in two different levels, one at the associate level for young scientists that show promise as a contributing scientist, and also at the full level for those who have demonstrated a uh, contribution to science. We also sponsor every year the Christopher Reed Science Competition, named after our friend and former uh, late colleague Chris Reed, who is a professor in the biology department here. Uh, this is a competition among students who are completing honors theses in science fields. And uh, we have a judging team. Let's see who of them are here. Chuck Dalian from the Ripple Microscope. I don't think Chuck is here. Uh, Meredith Kelly, is Meredith here? No? Oh, Meredith's there in the back row. OK. And Robin Barbato, is Robin here? From Krell, who's a microbiologist at Krell. So the four of us constituted the judging team this year. And once again, we are just overwhelmed by the quality of the research that goes on to complete honors theses here at Dartmouth. If you walk out in the front area, you will see scientific posters that are as good as you find at national meetings. It's just outstanding. It's amazing, which makes it pretty darn hard to choose some winners. Uh, all participants in the Chris Reed Science Competition are nominated by the chapter for associate membership in Sigma Xi. And we'd like to give an award to every one of you because it's just an a, a impressive group amount of uh, science that you've done and quite a breadth. Needless to say, we have to decide on some winners. So to announce the winners of the Reed Science Competition, I'll do this in kind of reverse order. And once again, we can't kind of const 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 constrain ourselves to just first, second, and third. So we have a couple of duplicates. So we have two third place winners. Um, the first of the third place winners is Nejek Zupan in mathematics for his project, Seasonal Fluctuation in Tsetse Fly Populations and Human African Trypanosomonas, a Mathematical Model. Nejek, are you here? All right. <laughs> his advisor is Dorothy Wallace. Okay, the second third place prize 
uh, is awarded to Sarah Anazizi from the chemistry department for her project, a light-driven chiral molecular switch in liquid crystal. Her advisor is Yvonne Apremian. Sarah Ann, are you here? Sarah Ann. She's not here. Okay, we'll put this little uh, ribbon on her poster so you can congratulate her when you see her. Let's give her a round of applause anyway, wherever she is. Okay, second place winner this year is Callie Proust from the biology department. Her work linking vibra cholera chemotaxis in the aquatic environment and human host. Her advisors are Ron Taylor and Kathy Cottingham. Is Callie here? It's Kaylee. <laughs> okay, first place winner in the 2014 Chris Reed Science Competition, Laurel Anderson from the Department of Physics. Her thesis, Experimental Control of Spin Chain Dynamics. very much. Turn back over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's see. Is Dave Coates in the room? No. Okay, thank that's where I was looking. Okay. Okay. So, we come to the very exciting portion of our program. Um, we uh, could not uh, have invited our keynote speaker, a Yorker Corsa, a Yorker, a Yoko, a Yoko <laughs> Corsa, we've been practicing. Uh, Mills Teddy was her name when she was here. Many of us knew her and loved her when she was an undergraduate. Dave Coates really wanted to be here to introduce you. Um, he gave us some notes, so I'm not this, and Tom Corman also wanted to be here to introduce you. So the computer science department made her visit from Ghana possible. I will try and do justice to her illustrious career to date. I'm sure we'll hear more from Oyoko shortly. Ayoko is currently the assistant professor of computer science at the Ashesi University in Ghana. She has been on the faculty for three years and was recently named chair of the department. As a member of the Dartmouth class of 2001, she was a computer science major. She was also a first year WISP intern with Chris Levy at the Thayer School of Engineering. And she did her senior honors thesis with, Dave, with Professor Dave Coates. Then she stuck around and began graduate work at Thayer School. She got her BE and her Master's of Science at Thayer in 2003. After that, she returned to her native country in Ghana for a year of teaching. She entered the PhD program at Carnegie Mellon University, arguably the top robotics program in the world, and that's where she completed her PhD in 2011. She went back to Ghana to join the computer science faculty at Ashesi University, oh, chair of the department. In 2012, she co-founded the African Robotics Network, Network, otherwise known as AFRON, to promote collaboration on robotics-related education and research across the continent. In 2012, Wired Magazine wrote about one of AFRON's initial projects, a contest in which entrants were asked to design a robot for under $10. And you can read that article yourself by Googling, because he put a URL here, which we obviously aren't going to put up. But she ended up winning a 2013 Tribeca Disruptive Innovation Award, TDIA. We are so pleased to welcome Ayoko back to Dartmouth and look forward to hearing more about her exciting robotics work in Africa. So please join me in welcoming Ayoko. Is 
that sound okay? So good afternoon. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to be back at Dartmouth. Um, it's been quite a long time. And as Kathy mentioned, um, in 1998, so 16 years ago, a very long time ago, I presented my very first research poster at this event. It was a much smaller event at the time. Um, we weren't in this built, beautiful building at the time. But it, I had just done a WISP internship, as um, Kathy mentioned, with Professor Chris Levy in the engineering school. And as a first year student who loved science and math and really wanted to be an engineer, it was an amazing opportunity to not only learn about engineering, but to actually do research and find out something new and contribute to science. In my conversations um, in the past couple of days, um, yesterday and today um, with a few students, I'm, I'm amazed at the work that um, the undergraduates here are doing in research, in advancing science, even freshmen you know, and, and sophomores. It's, it's, it's very, very inspiring. And it's a testament to what an amazing place Dartmouth is. It's a very special place. So I'm honored to be here and to be speaking to such a great group of scientists. I, um, in this talk, I just wanted to share my story of discovery of science and technology and kind of my winding path um, in, in exploring my interests and my, um, my love of science. And I've kind of divided it into a story of three parts. The first part I call exploration and discovery. Um, the next part I call digging deeper. And then the third part I call giving back. So um, I'm from Ghana, as Kathy mentioned, but I actually grew up in Nigeria because that's where my parents were um, working when I was a small child. And even in primary school, I loved science. So if you ask me what, you want, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said, oh, I want to be a scientist. But I had no idea that there were different types of science or you know, what exactly a scientist did. But I always said, I want to be a scientist. Um, now, Ghana and Nigeria are interesting countries. They are very similar in many um, regards, but also very different. And there's a, there's a friendly rivalry between them. But one thing that is true of both countries, and probably of many countries in the world, is that they're countries of contrast. You have very rural areas. You have very urban areas. You have fishing communities. You have crowded cities with lots of um, traffic. But also in terms of you know, availability of resources and access to opportunity, there's also great contrast. So on the left um, I have the high, is the high school I had the privilege of going to. And on the right is a primary school in Brekusu, which is the rural community where Ashesi is located. Um, and as you can see, the kind of resources available to these two um, schools is very, very different. And that's where the whole issue of, you know, what are the challenges of development and how can each of us, regardless of what our area is, you know, whether you're a scientist, whether you're an artist, whether that you're an economist, how can you contribute back to the community that you're from or the society that you're from in order to make it better and to kind of get rid of some of these disparities that exist? So as I mentioned, you know, I love science. I had the opportunity to go to a public school in Ghana, but it was a good public school. Um, in Ghana, all the schools wear uniforms and they're very strict and it's almost, you know, we walked in straight lines like in a military academy, but it really gave me the opportunity to learn more about science. Um, and I loved it because it, to me, like I loved chemistry because it explained what I saw in the world around me. I always wondered why is it when you put something oily in a plastic wrapping, the oil seems to end up on the outside of the wrapper, you know, and I, we did a little bit of organic chemistry. I was like, aha, now I understand why. Um, and so although I didn't really have the opportunity to do a lot of um, practical things, and I definitely didn't have the opportunity to do research, I just loved reading and learning about all these concepts, which really explained the world around me. Now, after high school, I had the opportunity of meeting a really uh, a amazing educational advisor. A friend of mine had suggested, you know, why don't you consider going to school in the US? I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll investigate it. And I met this educational advisor who loved Dartmouth and said, you should think about Dartmouth. And she introduced me to a Dartmouth alumni who ran a small company in Accra. And he basically made it his mission to make me love Dartmouth and want to come here, and he succeeded. He gave me a job for a year, so I worked for him for a year, and that was actually the first time I ever used a computer. I'd never used a computer before in my life. And you know, that's how, in the fall of 1997, I ended up at Dartmouth. And I love new experiences, and so this was like the ultimate collection of new experiences, from the New Hampshire winter, 
Um, to, you know, I, so I basically set out to take advantage of the opportunities that Dartmouth offered and try things that I would, had never tried before, would never have the opportunity to try before. So for example, for PE, I took horse riding and ice skating and skiing and ballroom dancing, you know, nothing, nothing that I would have the opportunity to do in Ghana. I went on a language study abroad program, even when one of my computer science professors warned me that it would delay my major because I was already behind, but I went anyway because I thought I would never have such an opportunity. Um, on the academic side of things, you know, I had, in, in high school, you know, I loved science and math, and so someone once told me, if you like science and math, then you should be an engineer. So I said, okay, well, if that's what people who love science and maths do, then I'll, I'll become an engineer. And because I, I love chemistry, I thought I'd be a chemical engineer. So, you know, when I got to Dartmouth, I set about taking all the prerequisites, the many, many, many prerequisites for engineering. <laughs> Those of you who are engineering majors um, know that. You know, I, I, and I enjoyed them, but I also loved Dartmouth's liberal arts philosophy. Um, the idea that I could take a class in literature, which I had never done before. I could take a class in music. Education has always been really important to me because I think that's really the answer to anything. You know, any challenges any African community faces, I think if people have the opportunity for good education, all of those um, problems are going to be solved. So, you know, I was able to take an education class and these were opportunities I wouldn't have had if I had gone to one of the traditional universities in Ghana where, you know, you're very narrow. If you're studying chemical engineering, that's what you're studying. Now, I took a, um, one of the prerequisites for the engineering major was a computer science class. So, I don't know, how many people know Professor Corman, Tom Corman? Some people, maybe? Anyway, so I took, a, I took um, co introductory computer science from Professor Corman, and he made it his mission to make me a CS major. <laughs> you know, he, so, so have you changed your major yet? When are you changing your major? Um, and so that's how you know, I, I, I gradually, I moved from being an engineering major to being engineering modified with computer science, then became computer science modified with engineering. <laughs> And I never quite moved all the way over to computer science, but that, that was the major I graduated in. And I loved, you know, I loved it. I, I loved being able to tell the computer what to do and have it do things. I loved being able to build things. And, you know, you stay up all night, you tear your hair out, but then eventually works. And you're like, wow, that's so cool. You know, I, I made this happen. I always wanted to... Um, give back to my community, but I wasn't sure exactly how. I always said, okay, I'm going back to Ghana. You know, when people ask me, what, what are you going to do after graduation? I'm going back to Ghana. But you know, when I was in my, my final year, I was planning to stay and do the BE anyway, and then Thea gave me a direct admittance to the master's program. So I said, okay, well, maybe I'll just stay and do a master's while I figure out what I want to do. And that's when I took my first robotics class. I went to a talk about robotics first, and I was like, wow. Now that is cool. I thought programming was cool, but this is just like programming combined with engineering and it's moving in the real world. I want to learn about this. And so I signed up for a robotics class and that's where my love of robotics began. But there was a pause as I was trying to figure out what to do. I was thinking of going to grad school and on one of my visits home, the Dartmouth alum who I had worked for before coming to Dartmouth introduced me to a friend of his. He says, there's someone I think you should meet because he knew I, I loved education, and I thought education was really important. So he said, I want you to meet my friend Patrick Ewa. <coughs> Patrick Ewa was a young, he was under 40 at the time, a young Ghanaian who had come to university in the US, worked for Microsoft for many years, and in trying to think how to give back to Ghana, had basically asked the question to himself, how, how might he or how might we all contribute to a re renaissance in Africa? And from doing some studies and talking to many people, he came to the conclusion that leadership really matters. You know, think when, when a hospital doesn't function properly, it's probably because the leadership of the hospital is not really thinking straight. When a country doesn't function properly, it's probably because the leadership of that country is, are not doing the right things. Now, in Ghana, it turns that out that only 5% of the population gets to go to university, right? So by definition, if you go to university, you're going to be some kind of leader. You might not be the leader of the country, but you might be the leader of a company. You might be, you know, you're an employer. You might run a ministry. Only 5% of the country go to university. Going to university means that you're going to be a leader. And from further 
You know, so he basically came to the conclusion that the question of transformation in Africa is a question of leadership, and it's really important how we train our leaders. He talked about visiting um, universities in Ghana and feeling that the students there were graduating with more of a sense of entitlement than a sense of responsibility. And he decided that he wanted to do something to help change this. And so put together a team and created a university called Ashesi University. Ashesi means beginning in one of the native languages. So the university started instruction in 2002. In small rented buildings in Accra, you wouldn't really think that was a university. Um, they started with a very small number of students, like something like 15 students, students who were risk takers. It's, uh, it's actually really amazing to see now what those students are doing. Because who, you know, who bets on a new university and signs up to a university that has no students to be the first class of 15, you know? You have to be a risk taker. Um, so Ashesi started with undergraduate programs in computer science and business administration. And um, on the website, it, it states its mission as the, um, to train a new generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders in Africa to cultivate within our students the values of lifelong learning, concern for others, and the courage to think in a bold and enterprising way. I was inspired when I met Patrick, and I was inspired by the Ashesi story. I said, you know, I think I want to be part of this. So when I finished that day, I decided I was going to take a year off and go and work at Ashesi. So that was in 2003, just in the second year of its existence. So these are, this is a picture of, you know, from the early days of Ashesi. I think this was a few years in because there are definitely more than 15 students <laughs> here. But I had an interesting experience. So um, I met this young woman, Regina Ajare, in one of my introductory programming courses in 2003. Um, and she was, you know, she was struggling with computer science. She was trying to decide whether she wanted to be a computer science major. She found it hard. We spent, because it was such a small university, we could have one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and you know, we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, and she stuck with it. Um, fast forward 10 years, last year, Regina, so Regina now runs her own software company. She also runs a program um, that basically focuses on getting girls into technology and girls into IT. And last year, she won a $75,000 social impact award. I get goosebumps when I tell her story because I had no idea when I, you know, when I was sitting one on one with her trying to do Java in 2003 that this is what she would be doing 10 years later. So after that year of Ashesi, I loved it, but I, I um, also loved robotics and wanted to go on and study more. And I also realized that, you know, you can't be a professor forever if you don't have a, a PhD. So I decided I'd better go get a PhD. So I, um, I applied to and went, and went to Carnegie Mellon to study robotics. Um, and as I was telling some students today, I am amazed that the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon accepted me given that I had had one robotics class and I had done no research in robotics, but I was just like, I really want to learn this stuff. Um, and I think, I think it's important for educational institutions to take a chance on people, you know, don't, don't, not just to go with the, the safe bet, but you know, take a chance, say, well, you know, maybe this person is going to do something great. And that's what Carnegie Mellon did for me, which I'm really grateful for. Um, I, I, I've always loved space, um, and so when I had the opportunity to work with a professor who was working on a program funded by NASA, the Mars Technology Program, um, I was really excited to get involved with that project. Now, um, we were particularly looking at how to um, create algorithms that would enable a robot to figure out the best path to take from one point on, say, a planet to another point that was several kilometers away. So what we called long-range traverse planning. We were interested in a couple of issues. Um, you know, path planning in robotics is not a, is not a new area. They've been, we've been doing path planning you know, ever since robots were, the first AI robot was created in 1960. And one common way of doing path planning is you know, if you have some terrain that you need to you need to traverse, you kind of break up the world into a grid, and some of the grid cells you label as um, free, so they have a very low cost. Some you might label as obstacles, so they have a high cost associated with them. And some might be traversable, but not so easy, and so they might have a medium cost. So you basically just overlay a grid 
over the world. And then you, do a you run a search algorithm on this grid and come up with a path that takes you from one grid cell to another. The problem with this approach is that it, com it comes up with a path that is not necessarily a smooth path. So the robot doesn't necessarily move in a very logical way. It, it makes sharp angles when there's no reason to make sharp angles. So one of the things we're looking at is how to come up with algorithms that would come up with a smooth path, but still be an optimal path, um, and still use um, kind of a discrete planning approach. Another thing we were interested in was dealing with energy. If you have a solar-powered ro robot on Mars, running out of power is a very bad thing, right? No one can just plug you in to recharge. So in, in, in um, following a path, you need to think about what the energy implications of that path are. So for example, let's say a robot is trying to get from the point marked the S to the point marked G. It could you know, reason not only about the terrain, but also about its battery energy as it, as it um, follows that path. And it might realize that, okay, I start out with a full charge. As I go along, you know, maybe shadows are lengthening because the day is ending. And I might get to a point where I realize that I'm actually going to run out of power if I follow this path. So then it might make sense, instead of doing that, to you know, stop before you get into the shadows, charge, and then continue the path. So the, the path planning algorithm actually needs to take energy into consideration. Or it might actually decide that it's better to take a longer path that doesn't go through the shadow. So the algorithms we were developing were aimed at coming up with smooth paths that also took um, energy into consideration. And I had the uh, wonderful opportunity of, um, they were running some field tests in the Atacama Desert in Chile with this robot called Zoe, which is meant to simulate a Mars rover. And they, they ran tests in the Atacama Desert because the Atacama Desert is more or less the most Mars-like environment on Earth because it really doesn't have a lot of life. Um, and they were, they were doing this in collaboration with a project that was looking at looking for life on um, other planets. And so we had the opportunity to test this algorithm. Um, it didn't work very well in Chile, unfortunately. So, you know, sometimes science doesn't go the way you want it to go. So we went back to the drawing board, improved it, and then later on had the opportunity to test it in, at a site in California. And this was just an example of, you know, this is the first path is the path that would have um, been created if you just used the normal grid planning. And then the second path was the actual path that our algorithm um, was creating. So it was, the time at CMU was really great because I had the opportunity to learn so much about robotics, about this field that I found just fascinating. But um, I never got rid of my love of education and my desire to somehow give back um, to my community. So while I was at CMU, I learned about a project called Project Listen that creates an AI-based automated reading tutor. And the way it works is that a child um, wears a headset with a mic and the tutor displays stories for the child and the child reads. And as the child reads, if the child makes mistakes, the tutor corrects the child because the tutor is using voice recognition. And it's, this research project had been going on for quite a while and they had had quite a bit of success. And I, I was very interested to find out whether a system like this would be useful in a place like Ghana, where we do have great literacy challenges. So in rural, in, especially in under-resourced schools or rural areas, you might have kids who you know, have gone through third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and still can't read properly. And there are many challenges, including things like maybe their parents aren't literate, so maybe no one's giving them one-on-one -on -one guided reading practice. So luckily, I had... I had um, supervisors or um, advisors in the PhD program who were very understanding of outside interests. So although I was you know, technically doing a robotics PhD and supposed to be focusing on this, we ended up coming up with a really um, time-consuming side project which involved doing field tests of the Project Listen Reading Tutor in Ghana and in Zambia. So we, we did a pilot study, and then we did a controlled study for four months, and then another pilot study in Zambia. And I just want to um, briefly talk about the controlled study. So we had um, 89 children from three different schools in Ghana. 
Um, the first school was a private school with mostly children from middle-income backgrounds. Then we had a public school in a low-income area that was a pretty under-resourced public school. And then we had a school that was, it was actually not really a school, it was an informal program for children who had never been able to go to school. And we took children from grades two through four, and we gave them the opportunity to use the reading tutor for two months. We had a treatment group and a control group, and we wanted to find out, do the children really benefit from the use of the reading tutor, taking into consideration the fact that many of these children might never have used a computer before. You know, so can they, can they figure out how to use the reading tutor, be comfortable enough with it, and actually benefit from it? Um, interestingly, so before going into the study, we did some pre-testing. Whoops. We did some pre-testing, um, and this, these were the pre-test scores. So the students in the first school, S1, going into the study, they were pretty good readers. And just for comparison, I've indicated what the US norms are, or average reading um, fluency of children in grades two, three, and four. So we, we can see that those children were, I mean, they're pretty good. They're as good as, say, American kids in learning how to read. However, the children from the other two schools were must, much less fluent in reading. And we were interested particularly in children from S2, the under-resourced public school. Could a program like this, an AI-based reading tutor, help them learn how to read? And we learned some interesting things. Um, we learned that with regular use of the reading tutor, children from the S2 school and the S3 school were able to improve their reading. The gains made by the S2 school were much greater than those made by the S3 schools. And the S1 children didn't improve their reading at all because they were already pretty good readers. So that was a very promising result. Um, however, we also realized that the way the world works, the S1 children were the children who had access to computers to run this reading tutor. Their schools had computer labs, whereas the S2 children and the S3 children did not have computer labs in their school. And our approach of busing the children every day to computer labs to use the reading tutor was not cost effective. So although we learned that this approach was possibly effective, we also learned it wasn't viable and sustainable. So that was an interesting study, and that's, um, that's still a, an interest of mine. So last year, a student of mine um, developed uh, the initial version of a reading tutor that runs on a tablet computer, with the idea that a tablet computer, first of all, is much cheaper than a regular computer, and maybe it's something that children might actually be able to use at home. So that's an interesting. Um, an interesting idea. Now, well, my, my computer is moving by itself to the next slide, <laughs> sorry. Um, so anyway, so this was one of the side projects, um, the reading tutor. But then I was also really, I mean, I was loving my robotics um, education, and I said, you know, it would be really cool if students in Ghana could learn about robotics. Because when I had taught at Ashesi for that first um, year, I had realized that the computer science students, you know, they were, they were really excited, but they had a very, very narrow conception of what computer science was and what they could do with it. You know, they were thinking that they would go work for some company and maybe they would, make, they would write software for payroll systems or, you know, banking transactions, which, you know, to me, it's kind of boring, right? No, no, you know, we need payroll systems, yeah, but computer, <laughs> computer scientists can do so much more. And to me, robotics was a great example, really showing how computer science can interface with the real world, can interface with physical systems, and you can actually have a, a computer-based system do something that is smart and intelligent. So I persuaded my... Um, my PhD advisor that it would be really cool if we designed a robotics course and went one summer and taught it at Ashesi University in Ghana. And as I said, I had amazing, ad amazing advisors. And she was really interested in this. And so she helped me, um, gave me advice as I designed a course. Um, and one summer, instead of doing a different internship, I decided I was going to go back to Ashesi and teach the course. But then my advisor came with me with another professor from the Robotics Institute for, I think, three weeks or so to help us get started and get set up. Um, and that was an amazing experience. So here's a picture of the very first robotics course at Ashesi in 2006. 
Um, and the goals were really to help the students develop creativity to the, expand their notion of what computer science involves, to work with sensors, um, to learn about embedded systems, and also to relate it to the local context. So for example, we had a task where the students, although we mostly use these Lego um, robot kits with um, at the time, there was this thing called the handy board processor. Um, so we used that. But we also had the students build machines out of completely, we said you can only use locally available materials. You can't use Lego, you can't use a processor that has been imported, or you have wood, you have the, anything you can scavenge, you can use. Um, and that was a very interesting experience um, for the students. Again, I realized how impactful educational experiences can be. I remember on the very, you know, robotics, just like computer science, probably even more so, can be very frustrating. You know, sometimes you're just bagging, banging your head against the wall and you're like, why is this not working? Why is this not working? Um, but then when it works, it's really, really amazing. And I remember on the very last day of the program when we had a poster session, kind of like what you're having here today, one of the students came up to me and he said, you know, I, was, I always used to be afraid when I had to do a technical project, but now I have more confidence. Now I believe I can do it. And again, that, that comment almost made me cry because I realized what an important impact um, this experience had had on the students. So I did you know, more interesting work at Carnegie Mellon, loved it, and then when I was done, I decided um, that I was going to go back and join Ashesi University again, this time full time um, as a computer science professor. And Ashesi had changed in the time I was away. So um, the year I moved back in 2011 was the year that Ashesi finished construction of its new campus out in Brikusu, a kind of a rural area on the outskirts of Accra. And so this is what the campus looks like now, which is very different from those tiny buildings in the middle of Accra. And in, in that time, um, Ashesi has actually come a long way. A few years ago, um, or a couple of years ago, it was voted the seventh most respected institution in Ghana, which usually universities aren't even included in that um, whatever competition it is or <laughs> that um, came up with this assessment. But so that, that was a big surprise. So now there are about 600 students. So still it's not huge. It, it's, it's a fairly small university, about 500 alumni. Um, it's built a pretty good track record for itself um, and is gaining national recognition and a little bit of global recognition. So it's, it's fun to be back there, back at Ashesi. And again, you know, the mission of the university is still the same, to train ethical entrepreneurial leaders in Africa. It's the only university in Ghana and probably in Africa that has an honor code like, like Dartmouth does. Um, but my personal, you know, mission is to really train you know, I think training everyone is good, but I want to train technologists who can really solve the problems of the local community. I can't solve all the problems, but I know if we have enough smart scientists and um, technologists, engineers, computer scientists, they will figure out how to solve the problems that we face locally. So um, I still teach robotics at Ashesi, so these were the robotics class in the past couple of years, and the we always do really interesting projects. So last year, the students developed or started developing a tour guide robot for the campus. Um, it's not fully working yet. It, it, they did, they did, <laughs> they did um, a good demo, um, but it definitely needs a lot more work. Um, you know, and. Students have done projects in multi-robot coordination, um, trying to come up with a system for sorting grain, and also games, you know, just because those are fun. But apart from trying to inspire our students, the Ashesi students, um, we're also really interested in getting high school students, first of all, to even consider computer science and engineering as an option, and really to be inspired by what they can do with it. So we run a summer program um, for high school students, but we, uh, we work, so there's faculty um, running the program, but we also have like an army of Ashesi students, mentors, who basically are with the, the high school students 24 hours a day, you know, in the classroom, in the dorms, outside the, um, 
outside of academic time. Um, and this program basically tries to use robotics to inspire high school students to study science, technology, engineering, and math. We, we try to use locally relevant examples. So the, the community that Ashesi is um, located in now is a rural community and they're mostly farmers. They grow a lot of pineapples. So a couple of years ago um, for the high school program, the challenge that the students had to work on was, you know, they were, they were told that the farmers of Brekusu have decided to expand their pineapple production but now they need help harvesting because they have way too many pineapples to harvest by hand. So you've been tasked with coming up with a pineapple harvesting robot, for example. So the idea is really to make the students realize that technology isn't just some fancy thing. You know, robotics isn't just some fancy thing that is used in the US or Japan, but there might actually be locally relevant applications of it. As Kathy mentioned, a, co um, a couple of years ago, we also created the African Robotics Network. And this, um, this came about because, you know, for, for a little while, I thought maybe I was the only person in Africa who was interested in robotics. And then I realized that that's actually not true. But in, you know, many different countries in Africa, there are people who, first of all, like me, are interested in using robotics as a way of inspiring young people to study engineering and computer science. But there are also people who are doing robotics research um, in, in various, um, you know, to address various problems. And so we decided that it would be helpful to create a community such that people who are interested in or working in robotics in Africa could actually com um, collaborate or communicate, share information, etc. So Afron is mostly an electronic community. We have a mailing list where members can um, share information. But we also, um, for the past couple of years, have hosted a design challenge each year. Um, and we call this project the Ultra Affordable Robot Project. The reason we did this was, you know, for example, at our programs at Ashesi, we use the Lego Mindstorm Robotics Kits, which are great little um, kits to teach anyone from, you know, someone who's eight years old to someone who's in university about robotics. But these kits cost something like $400 each, which for an under-resourced school in Ghana is completely out of... Um, out of reach. So we were interested in, you know, what, what, what would happen if you had a robot that cost $10? You know, can we challenge designers from around the world to design a robot, an educational, a robot for education that would cost, definitely we said less than $100, but if you can get to $10, we'll be very excited. So these were some of the entries that were submitted um, in the first round of the competition. Um, lots of interesting creative robots. One of our favorites was the Lollibot. Um, the Lollibot was designed by um, Tom Tilly, who is actually a professor in Thailand. So this was a global competition. Anyone around the world could participate. So Tom Tilly took a game controller, like what you would use to play, um, you know, a PlayStation game or something like that. And for people who are gamers, you know that sometimes the um, game controllers have feedback so that you can, you know, when so I don't play games, but I guess, you know, when something exciting um, is happening in the game, you actually have that haptic feedback where the, the controller is vibrating. And the way it achieves this is that it has two small motors inside the controller. And so what Tom did was that he cut the sides of the game controller off, took the motors out, and turned them sideways so that he could attach bottle caps as wheels to these rumble motors. Um, he then, you know, the, the, you have these, the thumb, whatever you call them, the, <laughs> the, the um, I guess they're called thumbsticks that you use to control the, play, um, the game controller. He put lollipots lollipops on them as weights so that when the robot bumped into something, it would push the thumb stick back. And then you had a bump sensor on the robot. He also added a light, he you know, modified the circuitry and added a light sensor. And all of this, so I guess in Thailand, um, game controllers are really cheap. So he did all of this for $8.96. You know? <laughs> so that was really, really cool. Um, so we, 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 we're now, looking at, you know, what, what are, um, 
is there a way we can, so first of all, the, the design has been published, you know, as an open source design, so anyone can build it. And we actually, you know, as part of the workshop at Ashesi last year, we had the high school, let's build the lollibot, and they were just, they were blown away. It, it, it was so cool for them. Most of them had never used a soldering iron before, so they, they really enjoyed that experience. But we're also interested in looking at, is there a way we can make these kits available to schools so that they can actually have, you know, a really cheap robot? So in all this, you know, as I mentioned, the goal is to really help inspire young technologists um, to really become the next innovators, both for Africa and for the world. So as part of that, it also involves trying to get undergraduate students involved in research. Um, Ashesi is nowhere near like Dartmouth, where you know first-year students are publishing, you know, you know, research that could actually go and be published in a in a conference um, or a journal. But many students do a senior capstone um, project, like a, the a senior thesis. So I just wanted to show you one example of a project that a student, one of my students, did um, this past year. And to me, it's an example of really looking at how you can take, you know, the AI machine learning, computer science um, knowledge that we're gaining and apply them to locally relevant problems. Um, this is a map of an area near Ashesi. Ashesi is somewhere around here, um, down there on the map. And according to the map, you know, you have two roads, right? They look about the same. Agree? Yes? Mm -hmm. In reality, this is what the two roads look like. This road is a nicely paved, very smooth road, highway quality, and this road is a landmine. <laughs> you know, you, you, it would take, you know, wh while it might take you 15 minutes to drive along this road, it would take you about an hour to get to a chassis along that road. Um, so we realized that, you know, Google Maps is a great tool. Many people use them in different parts of Africa, use Google Maps in different parts of Africa. However, it doesn't necessarily provide all the information that would be useful to someone who would like to move from one place to another. Because in different, you know, in Ghana at least, not all roads are good. Some roads are really bad. Um, so we were interested in whether there's a way of actually learning which roads are bad and then making that information available to future motorists. And since most people have mobile phones and phones have all sorts of fun sensors in them, we're looking at the accelerometer in the cell phone. And so, you know, he did, my student did an experiment where he drove along a good road and a bad road and just measured accelerometer readings. And as you can see, the good road had, you know, nice smooth readings and the bad roads, the readings are going all over the place. So that gives us a hint that we might be able to use this information to actually, you know, Yes, you know, some people have the bad luck of driving on the bad roads, but if we can then, you know, get the accelerometer, um, you know, crowdsource accelerometer data, learn that this is a bad road, we can then warn future users not to use that road. So a couple of students were working on this project, and so um, they, dis they classified a bunch of roads into good, bad, and fair took accelerometer readings and used a machine learning algorithm to actually predict, you know, try to predict is a road good, bad, or fair based on the accelerometer readings. And then modify Google Maps to actually display that information on the map for people to use. Um, and it was quite promising, you know, he, um, we were able to distinguish good roads uh, from bad roads with about a 90% accuracy is what Delali came up with, which was very impressive. Um, but he couldn't distinguish bad roads from fair roads. Um, so there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done. But I was really excited about this project because to me it's, a, I, it's one of the first times I'm seeing one of my students not just learning about technology but actually getting into research and contributing to the knowledge that is out there. And I think once we have more people doing this, then will really be able to tackle some of the development challenges that we have in Africa. Okay. I just wanted to end um, with a quotation that has um, always inspired me. And I think it's an important quotation for everyone, um, and particularly for scientists, right? Because scientists solve difficult problems every day. Um, and it talks about how really what contributes to our happiness isn't our wealth or our, you know, 
I don't know, what fun things we do in life, but really our ability to solve difficult problems. Because when you can solve a difficult problems, it, problem, it gives you such satisfaction, right? And I think that's what we as scientists or as technologists try to do every day, solve difficult problems, um, important problems. And that's what I wish for um, all the students who are presenting today, a lifetime of solving difficult problems. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Um, I want to make uh, sure that WISP interns know at the end of the session, the poster session is scheduled to begin at 5 o'clock and run to 7. WISP interns, please come to the front so we do a group picture before you head out of the room. Um, the other thing we forgot to mention is that all the Sigma Xi winners will be exhibited in the Kresge Library. Thank you for being here, Jane, quickly to remind me of that. So you'll be in touch with them so that they'll be up and in the library. Um, any other announcements that I'm forgetting? I don't think so, but again, I want to thank the Computer Science Department and Tom Corman, who could not be here today, because that's how we ended up getting Ayoko here. So questions? Anybody? Hi. Yes, Henry. <laughs> Do you have a setup so that if Americans want to donate either to Afron or your university small quantities of money that we can do that. Is there a website? Is there a way? Is, can, we, can we click here and do that? Can we ro roboticize that yet? <laughs> um, for for Ashesi, um, there is, so if on the Ashesi website, um, there's information about how to give to Ashesi. Ashesi actually, so you know, um, Patrick, when he was setting up the university, he actually went to business school. Um, you know, he, he's not, he doesn't have a PhD, but he went to business school to figure out a good way, a sustainable way of running a private university in Ghana. And one thing he did was that he set up a nonprofit um, foundation that's based in Seattle. And so they are, basically, they do a lot of fundraising for Ashesi. Um, so the, the donations are usually channeled through them. And for Afron, we actually don't have a way to donate, but we need money, so that's a good, <laughs> a good idea. We'll figure out a way to make that happen. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, please. You mentioned that only 5% of the people in Ghana end up going to a college to get a college education. Can you make it an effort, or is it a university making an effort to make that more accessible to a wider range of people? So um, as I mentioned, Ashesi University is very small, um, and it's you know there are many reasons why it's 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 small. But one thing Ashesi does do, which is um, very different from any university in Ghana, is that although so Ashesi University is a private university, so it's completely funded on tuition, and it's quite an expensive university. However, Ashesi has need-based financial aid, just like how you know like Dartmouth does. So you have students who are paying full tuition and you have students who are not paying a dime. And then that way you're able to get a great diversity of really smart um, students. And so the approach with Ashesi is kind of make high impact on a small number of students knowing that they're going to go out and do great things. We don't really have the capacity to have 50,000 students like some of the public universities have. Yes. Could you describe what the public university system is in Ghana? Um, so there are some, you know, some great public universities. Um, there are about five um, or so state-run universities that are fairly large, you know, with thousands, tens of thousands of students. Um, Well-established um, with a variety of majors. So for example, there's a school in Kumasi that focuses mostly on engineering. There's one, a school that focuses mostly on arts and sciences. Um, and so these are, by and large, good institutions. Um, there are a few challenges in public education, though. I mean, these are publicly supported universities, so funding sometimes becomes an issue. You have, there's always pressure to accept more and more students, so you have really large class sizes. You might have, you know, a class of 300, um, students. 
not necessarily a lot of opportunity to do hands-on work. Um, but that said, you know, there are some good programs that are churning out really good um, graduates. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as you may know, Dartmouth joined the edX um, initiative earlier, I guess. I just year. learned that today. Yeah. So, um, and actually earlier today, I was at a talk where uh, some folks from edX were talking about the program and, and it was very interesting. So I wonder um, some of the opportunities for MOOCs um, to contribute mm -hmm. in sort of hybrid ways and blended ways with mm -hmm. institutions. I wonder if you've maybe given any thought to how something like edX course offerings might um, mm -hmm. be applicable in the environment in you know, Shesi or in Ghana. Um, we have given a little bit of thought to that. So um, on an informal level, I, I do know that some Ashesi students and Ashesi faculty um, take advantage of MOOCs when needed. I mean, I'll give a personal example. A couple of years ago, I had to teach a course, which I took way back in grad school. It wasn't my um, primary area of research. And I had, although I'd taken the course, now I had to teach it. So the first thing I did was I went on to Coursera and I found a machine learning course at Stanford and I went through that course, first of all, to just refresh my memory and also to get some ideas of good ways of, of teaching it. Um, and I know, you know, sometimes I encourage, so if a student is trying to say do a final year project in an area where we don't have, we're not able to offer that class at Ashesi, or the student hasn't had the opportunity to take that class. Sometimes I, you know, I recommend to them, hey, why don't you take this Coursera course to help you figure out how to do what you need to do. Um, so those are the ways in which um, they've been used. I, I tried one experiment once with a new course where we were actually watching Coursera videos together. It was a small class of about six students. Um, that didn't work out very well. Um, and so if I were to do an ex another a similar experiment, I would structure it differently such that students are watching videos on their own, doing work on their own, and then we meet periodically to discuss them. But I haven't really done much experimentation with that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So that, that's, that's actually you know, a, a challenge. So at, um, I mean, obviously the internet is available, the kinds of speeds that are available are much less um, than here. So you tend to wait, you know, if you want to watch a, a YouTube video, what you do is you pause it, you let it buffer completely, and then you play it so you can watch it. Otherwise it's going to keep chopping. Um, in terms of the, so there, you know, there are internet service providers where you can pay a monthly fee, et cetera, but Mobile, the mobile telephone providers are actually probably the largest providers of internet services um, now. Where, so even people who are accessing the internet on their computers, you can purchase these little USB dongles that are um, using the cellular network. Um, or many people also access the internet on their phones. So because of the bandwidth and speed rich restrictions, it does limit the ability of people to really use um, those resources the way they were meant to be used, because sometimes the videos become a challenge. What I did when um, I downloaded the videos, actually, um, and then watched them offline. And um, there's actually a student at Ashesi, um, Petameni, he's from Liberia. And he, what he did was that he created a local repository of Khan Academy. And he actually, so he did a project, he went back to Liberia and did a project where um, he helped schools establish local repositories of Khan Academy to help them prepare for their final exams. Um, and that project was so successful that the Ashesi professor who teaches pre-calculus actually worked with him to do something like that at Ashesi for the Ashesi students who needed extra um, practice with math. So, you know, thinking about how things can come offline is, is usually helpful. We're running late. Okay, sorry. Your session needs to start. You're going to be here for at least an hour or so yes. until mm -hmm. you need to go off. So let's give another round of applause. Wisp interns, come here. Thank you so much.